I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter, calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the General Tom Thumb Tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn, through Barnum's own words, about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. A Mountain of Worries I suspect the past two years have encouraged greater sympathy in all of us for others' difficult times, and especially people's worries about family members' health. In this episode, we delve into a new batch of the letters P.T. Barnum wrote while in France and sent back to his family and business associates in America. These letters have a different tone from the letters written in preceding weeks. No longer sounding buoyant, confident, and on top of things, with a solution for every problem that arose, the letters from September 12th to 14th, 1845, possess a different kind of intensity. Barnum was writing from the heart, perhaps feeling particularly lonely at the time, and his letters covered the gamut of emotions, annoyance, disappointment, frustration, even anger, while also expressing empathy and love for those he held dear. Still, there seemed to be an undercurrent of other deep worry infused in this larger-than-usual outpouring of ink. Fortis Hitchcock, Barnum's friend and American Museum manager, received a dense eight-page letter. Particularly striking are letters to his wife, Charity, and another to their eldest daughter. They sound quite harsh. What was going on? Apparently a lot. One of those times when life just keeps slinging things at you. For Barnum, who at that point was traveling alone, he was usually a week or more ahead of General Tom Thumb's entourage, letter writing had to be his outlet, while his solace was receiving letters and newspapers from home. He told his wife, There's nothing affords me so great relief as to get letters from America. Yet Barnum's letters to Charity and Caroline at this time didn't sound like ones they would have happily received. Charity's perpetual poor health was a constant source of concern to her husband, and her apparently nervous disposition and anxieties seemed to exasperate him. We do not know anything specific about Charity's illnesses. Barnum's letters to others tell us that she only infrequently went out in the carriage and otherwise stayed at home. His letter to her, dated September 12th, began with sympathy. 
I was a little relieved to learn that Helen, their five-year-old daughter, was better, though I am in continual misery on her and your accounts. It is dreadful to have sickness when we are so far apart, but I hope it will all prove for the best. Ending the letter, his words were less compassionate. You certainly are surrounded with the comforts of life. You are in want of nothing except health, and as you have every convenience and are able to engage any assistance necessary, I hope you will have courage and keep up your spirits till I return. There are none so unhappy as those who fancy themselves so. I am engaged every moment of the day and riding in the diligence nearly every night. In fact, the business is so hard for me, I am determined hereafter to take it a little easier. And referring to instructions he gave Charity in a previous letter, directing her to seek out land for sale in Bridgeport where they planned to build a grand home, Barnum bluntly tells her, Your accounts about the places for sale in Bridgeport is womanlike. First you say Orrin Sherwood will sell for $10,000, but you don't say how much land, so of course I can't judge whether it is best to buy. Then you say Deacon DeForest will sell seven acres, but you don't say for what price, so again I am left unable to judge what is best to do. However, I know you was sick and felt bad, so I will not quibble at your unbusinesslike letter. Ironically, and no doubt to avoid worrying Charity further on his account, he merely hinted at his own health troubles, noting that, I am homesick, have lost my fat, am losing the hair from the top of my head, and begin to think it is time to get home, lest I also lose myself. But he revealed a much more serious health concern to Fortis Hitchcock in a letter written the same day. I ought to be permitted to enjoy the fruits of my labor if I live, which I much fear will not be the case, as I am sadly afflicted with some painful and, I fear, fatal disease, which appears seated at the pit of my stomach. I suffer much from it, and as I am on my legs during the whole day and generally traveling by diligence through the whole night, I am getting worse. I have lost all my fat. I am now fast losing my hair from the top of my head. And if I don't lose my life before I get home, I shall be lucky. Continuing the next day in the same letter, he added, My health is much worse today. The disease of my breast, whatever it is, is getting serious. It is very painful. And if it continues to grow worse, I shall be in America before six weeks are past. With this in mind, we can perhaps forgive Barnum's tone in his September 13th letter to daughter Caroline, one that may have caused the 12-year-old to shed a few tears. Trying to play one parent off the other, she had apparently written to her father seeking his permission to attend a masquerade ball, but he would have none of that. He began by remarking that, I was very glad to read the good news that your letter contained, namely, that your mother would not let you go to a masquerade ball. In case his meaning was not abundantly clear, he continued, I am astonished that you would desire to go to such a place, where persons disguised and unknown could insult you with impunity. It is not a respectable or decent amusement, and although perhaps respectable persons may engage in it, they do it without proper reflection, and their doing so should be no excuse for your desiring to imitate them, don't let your foolish desire for novelty lead you into imprudences. Your whole soul at present should be bent upon one object, education. I have no doubt your mother lets you go to quite parties enough. There is no possible danger of your attending too few. For my part, I would prefer that you never attend another till you are at least 18 years of age. So you see, you get poor encouragement by complaining to me on that subject. Pushing the point further, he noted that her spelling needed improvement. Caroline had spelled whooping cough without a W, and affectionate with two N's. He admonished her, Children should not wish to go to parties till they are old enough to spell. Ouch. The next day's brief letter to Messrs. Rue and Company suggests another reason for Barnum's verbal lashing, and why he was feeling so overwhelmed trying to manage business and family matters while feeling so ill. In letters to others, Barnum referred to Rue as a scoundrel, so he clearly disliked dealing with the man. 
he was responding to Rue's letter of the 10th about signing treaties, or contracts, for Amsterdam and Mons. After declining to sign them, Barnum expressed his strong displeasure. Indeed, we do not wish to sign any more treaties at all. We are sick and tired of France. We have been altogether deceived regarding the country, and could have made 100,000 francs more if we had gone to England direct from Paris. Both the unexpectedly long travel time between towns, and the high taxes and fees Barnum found he had to pay for Tom Thumb's performances at each venue had really worn him down. He was particularly angered at having been deceived in regard to the poor laws that levied taxes on luxuries such as theater performances. In short, he was thoroughly fed up. While it may be more entertaining to discover the things Barnum wrote concerning his business enterprises and grand plans, the appeal of the letters in this copybook is their wide range of recipients, which in turn reveal Barnum more completely as a person, struggling mightily at times, and living in an era when the threat of an illness turning fatal could quickly rise to front of mind. It is something akin to the fear we have been experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. We all experience periods in our lives when bad things seem to pile up in short order, and clearly mid-September of 1845 involved that kind of turbulence for Barnum. The letters from pages 144 to 159 reveal even more worries than those noted earlier. Barnum's troubles were deeply felt, and of course, he did not know, as we do, that he would go on to live a long life and achieve far greater successes than even he could imagine at that time. Plenty of fun in Bridgepork. Our exploration of P.T. Barnum's letters from France now turns to focus on several that enlighten us about his role as a father of daughters and as a father figure to his protege, Charles Stratton, better known to the world as General Tom Thumb. Before we begin with the letters, I'd like to spotlight a beautiful portrait of the Barnum daughters which is in the Barnum Museum's collection and was a gift from his descendants. The portrait is in the Connecticut Digital Archives and is linked in the show notes. Interestingly, it is by far the most viewed item in our online digital collection, and we're happy, if surprised, that a painting has been so very popular. The portrait is quite a large oil painting by Frederick R. Spencer and is dated 1847, just two years after the letter we are perusing. It shows three of the four Barnum girls, Caroline, the eldest at age 14, Helen, the second daughter at age seven, and Pauline, the toddler, the fourth daughter born March 1, 1846. Charity was pregnant with Pauline at the time of the letters we are reading. Sadly, daughter number three, Frances Irene, had passed away on April 11, 1844, just shy of her second birthday. When that tragedy struck, Barnum was in England just beginning his European tour with General Tom Thumb, and his sorrow was undoubtedly compounded by his absence from home at such a difficult time, unable to comfort his wife and two daughters. So it was with amplified concern that in August of 1845, Barnum learned of five-year-old Helen's illness, whooping cough, soon after she and her mother and sister Caroline had returned home from Europe. At great length, Barnum confessed to Charity his deep fear that they might lose Helen, and told her that if that happened, the world would have but few attractions for me, and I should but little regret to be called to that world where there is no death, and where the parental heartstrings are not to be broken by the loss of near and dear children. Fortunately, Helen pulled through. Only a few days before the worrisome news, Barnum had written a letter to his little daughter, which her mother would read aloud to her. His tender note is quite delightful, with its description of toys and stories and the fun they would enjoy together upon his return. Teasing Helen about her childish interpretation of Bridgeport, Barnum wrote that he hoped she was well and was having plenty of fun in Bridgeport. Always concerned with his children's education, Barnum both encouraged and set a goal for Helen, telling her, I suppose that you are learning your book very fast and that when I come home, you will read to me. He wanted her to understand that fun was a reward for good behavior. Tell your friends we will have great times when I come home, 
We will play and romp and run and walk and ride and do all sorts of things. But you know, this is on condition that you are a good girl, as I'm sure you will be, and go to school, and mind your mother always, and go to Sunday school and not run away, and take your medicine good when you are sick. If you do all these things, then won't we have lots of pleasure when I come home? The apparently spirited Helen must have shown her opinion of attending Sunday school. She was nonetheless a very lucky little girl indulged with special toys while the family was together in Europe. Her father assured her, I shall not forget your carriage and ponies, and your beautiful doll which you left at Mrs. Lamson's, and maybe I shall bring you something else very nice, which you don't think about. That Barnum was a loving father is evident in his enthusiasm for a favorite shared pastime. He promised Helen he would have new stories for her. You know what nice stories I shall tell you. I am getting a great many new stories made up, and as I have nobody to tell them to, I must save them all for you. I want to see you very much. Presumably Caroline, who was seven years older than her sister, had outgrown her father's stories. Though wouldn't we like to hear them now? Indeed, Caroline was at an age when her formal education was of primary concern to her father, who was anxious that she attend a top-notch school and focus on subjects he felt suitable for female education, and learn them in French. We will explore Barnum's views on this in a future episode. Now let's turn to Barnum's role as a father figure to Charles Stratton, who was seven years old, a precocious seven, at the time these letters were written. Charles's own parents had little education, and according to Barnum's accounts, they lacked any degree of sophistication or morsel of interest in learning about the world, even while on the European tour. Barnum must have seen the need to support Charles intellectually and emotionally in ways his parents did not, while also indulging his mischievousness, referring to him playfully as the little rogue who is a sure card wherever he goes. Short snippets in the letters indicate that the two had a happy relationship, peppered with good-natured bantering. Writing to an unnamed correspondent, Barnum asks him to pass along a message. Tell the general he owes me 20 francs. My hat has all fell to pieces. He kicked it so hard at Vassin, so he has got to pay for another, and he must not pay me in old buttons neither. A delightful addition to the letters in the copybook is a page of little drawings, linked in the show notes, presumably made by Charles. The page includes the outlines of two tiny right hands, a man with an oversized head and buttoned jacket, and two other less distinct sketches. The sketch of the man, with his head of curly hair and prominent nose in profile, may even be a portrait of Barnum. Take a look. You can zoom in on the sketch if you use the link in the show notes to see it. And let us know what you think. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pinna and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.